Catholic youth gathered in Rome this week to draft a working document for the upcoming Synod on Young People. What do young Catholics really want from their church? The papal posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray will join us with analysis. And March 27th marked the second anniversary of the death of our dear foundress, Mother Mary Angelica. We'll remember her life and legacy with a special World Over tribute. The World Over, the Holy Week edition begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important world over for you tonight, the Papal Posse, Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, and a special remembrance of Mother Angelica on the second anniversary of her passing. All of that is straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, you can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo, or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Before we start, a big book birthday to announce. And some news. I'm delighted to report that Will Wilder 2, The Lost Staff of Wonders, is now out in paperback. It'll be premiering on April 3rd. I know a lot of you like paperback editions, and this one comes with an added bonus. Inside is a special preview of Will Wilder 3, and the title reveal, what is it, Will Wilder and I can't tell you yet. But you can pre-order this paperback edition of the Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonders Now, and get it in time for Easter. Both books in the Will Wilder series are now available in hardback, paperback, and dramatic audio. Go to willwilderbooks.com, to the EWTN Religious Catalog, Amazon, or your independent bookseller to order. And Will Wilder 3 is coming soon. Stay tuned for that. Now to some news. In spite of the reported imminent agreement between the Vatican and Communist China and a lessening of tensions, an underground bishop was arrested this week. According to Asia News, Bishop Vincent Guo Jin was detained on Monday to prevent him from celebrating the Chrism Mass with the underground faithful. Locals called it a kidnapping. According to the report, Bishop Guo had refused to celebrate the Chrism Mass with excommunicated Bishop Vincent Jean, the bishop recognized by the communist regime. Gao was released after the scheduled underground chrism mass. Bishop Guao is one of two underground bishops asked to step aside by the Holy See so that the communist recognized bishop can serve as the official diocesan leader recognized by Rome. According to a report in the UK tablet, Bishop Guao is reportedly now banned from celebrating any mass as a bishop on the grounds that he is not recognized by the communist government. And back in Rome, Pope Francis suggested during his Sunday homily that Jesus was the first target of fake news and spin by those who wish to twist his message for their own benefit. The comments came in the wake of an embarrassing resignation of the man handpicked by the pope to spearhead reform of the Vatican's media and communication efforts. Last week, Monsignor Dario Vigano resigned as the head of the Vatican Secretariat for Communication after being caught spinning some of his own fake news. Vigano had selectively released portions of a letter by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. It gave the appearance that Benedict was endorsing a series of books lending theological heft to Pope Francis and further praising his theological and philosophical formation. Moreover, Vigano was caught having submitted to the press a doctored photo of the letter that concealed its second page. In it, Benedict had actually said he never read the book series, did not plan to read it, and he further criticized the selection of one of the theologians who authored the series for his anti-papal initiatives. Neither Pope Francis nor Monsignor Vigano have publicly acknowledged any wrongdoing, nor has, has there been a public apology to Benedict or anyone else. Vigano, in his resignation letter to the Pope, vaguely mentions his many controversies that destabilizes the complex and great task of reform, which had been entrusted to him by Francis. For his part, the Pope said he accepted Vigano's resignation, not without some effort. 
He further praised Vigano for his work and is actually retaining him in a newly created Vatican position of assessor for the Secretariat of Communications. Also, during his Palm Sunday homily, Pope Francis urged young people not to be silent, but rather let their voices be heard, even in the face of corrupt or silent elders. The Pope's message to awaken the youth came on the heels of a meeting with more than 300 young Catholics at the Vatican, a preparation for next October's Synod of Bishops focusing on the youth. The Pope said that the temptation to silence young people has always existed. There are many ways to silence them, to sedate them, to make them invisible, to keep them from getting involved, to make their dreams flat, dreary, petty, and plaintive. But he told youths that you have it in you to shout, even if we older people and leaders very often corrupt, keep quiet. Here with analysis is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal with me in studio, and from Manhattan, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Now, Robert, you just got back from the preparation for this October Youth Synod. The Pope had 305 young people around him. They consulted with the young people. First of all, we're going to get into the document that they produced, kind of the preparatory document for the bishop's discussion in October. Why are we listening to young people who really haven't experienced a lot of life or of God, frankly? Well, my way of understanding this is I think that Francis likes these processes. He talks a lot about starting a process and just... Synodality. Synodality. And in this particular case, I mean, I... I, I'm a little bit divided in my reactions. On the one hand, I, I just love those young people there. They're, they're energetic. They're enthusiastic. They're sincere. The other side of it is they know almost nothing about the church, about why the church thinks the way that it does. Mm -hmm. And so they put out things that I think the bishops probably already knew. But it's part of what Pope Francis, I think, hopes will be a way of evangelizing, that by inviting people to speak, mm -hmm. to putting up, not putting up barriers to them immediately on moral mm -hmm. questions and on ecclesial questions, that somehow it'll engage them and bring them back into the, the fold. Obviously, the, the concrete suggestions that they make are suggestions that a 20-something person makes yeah. without understanding the, the nature of what they're talking about. Uh, now, Father Jerry, um, there was a lot of discussion about this, naturally. The Roman press, you know, the Vatican press always goes crazy over anything announced. They cover it like it's the Olympics. But um, th there was a lot of excitement about this. The question I have is, most of these young people are catechized not by the church, but by the world. So what what fruit can this dialogue, this interaction, bring forth? The dialogue is important if it's a dialogue in which information is being communicated to people who lack it. So uh, I'm always suspicious when there's a document with people who don't really know Catholic teaching then uh, tell us that we need to re-examine these teachings in order to be more relevant in the modern age. I think the, the mission of the church is to communicate the Word of God and it's obvious that that hasn't been very well communicated in the last 20, 30 years to the coming generation. So to sit down, and I looked at this document, and it's very concerning because it's basically rehashing uh, secular criticisms of Catholic morality and then bringing up the subject of uh, why don't we have women priests? Why isn't there equality in the church? Uh, this is not what we need to be discussing right now. This is basically just continuing what I would say is a revolutionary process that's fomented mm. when we take, take these questions and treat them as open questions. They're not open questions. Yeah, we're going to get into some of these open questions, as you say. Uh, this is the pre-synodal document uh, that these young people produced. We'll put it up on the screen. I want both of you to react to this. Uh, the church, oftentimes, it reads, appears as too severe and is often associated with excessive moralism. Sometimes in the church, it's hard to overcome the logic of it has always been done this way. We need a church that is welcoming and merciful. Robert Royal, your reaction. I've been a writer in my entire adult life, and for the last 10 years, I've been the editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, mm -hmm. and I detect in this text, 
mm. some other hands than those of the 20 year olds. There's something else mm -hmm. obviously going on here because the language that's being used is language that various officials in, in the church have, have been using. Look, the, the long and the short of this is, will a process like this actually evangelize the way that Father was talking about? Does it, does it go out to people? Does it teach them? Mm -hmm. And does it bring people in? We haven't right. seen that so far in this papacy. It's a very mm -hmm. different approach to, to the rest of the world. But like you, I believe that these young people have been catechized not by the church, mm -hmm. but by our culture. Mm -hmm. And if the church seems distant, it's not as if, as if the church has moved away from where it's always been, it's that the culture has moved away, and not simply away, but it has set itself up in opposition to the church. Mm -hmm. The church is still, I mean, we've got to recognize as weak as in many ways Catholicism is culturally, the church is really still the one institution in the West that stands against many of the developments that, that we see that are progressive and really depart quite far from biblical Christianity, both of the Catholic and evangelical mm -hmm. and Protestant varieties. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that these young people feel that, but whether it's the truth, whether the church yeah. is being moralistic and not, you know, not receptive, I think that that's another judgment that has to be made. Father Jerry, there was a line here, that we, we mentioned it a moment ago, uh, sometimes in the church it's hard to overcome the logic of it has always been done this way. That line that appears in this pre-synodal document, supposedly from these young people, allegedly, that was a line Pope Francis used in his opening address to them, that we have to get away from this notion that it has always been done this way. Are we, as Robert Royal wrote this week, looking at a little bit of ventriloquism here with uh, old Vatican hands using these kids as convenient mouthpieces? That's always the suspicion, Raymond, because uh, young people may not organize their thoughts in the precise language that we just heard. You know, to talk about the church is severe and moralistic. I mean, that's a complaint I hear constantly, usually from people who don't accept Catholic morality. Now, my question is, when you say things have always been done this way, we, that's not a justification. In the history of the church, since we're passing on a message given 2,000 years ago, doctrine, practices, ways of living, they're inherited, they're cherished and appreciated. And in fact, you know, people who are cultural Catholics, they look back mm -hmm. on their family formation as mainly the transmitter of faith through festivals and feasts and beliefs. Mm -hmm. If something has been done away in the church for a long time, the presumption is it's a good thing that we need to preserve. So, you know, the logic of it was done in the past, it needs to be rejected, unless you can explain it to me instantaneously why I need to do it. You know, that's a formula for chaos. I would not mm -hmm. agree that young people should be encouraged to say, whatever's in the past, just put it aside. We're going to give you a new formula today. Mm, interesting. Uh, Robert Earl, you wanted to add. Yeah, I, I think the Father makes the important distinction here that the, the thing that's always been done is if it's based on what Jesus himself and the revelation of God gave us in our New right. Testament and in the life of Christ, well, that's, a, that's actually a good thing that that is, has, has persisted right. over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing that we can say that doesn't have to be done the way it always has been done in the past is somewhat at the outreach, somewhat the way that you speak to people. I was very struck in this document that the young people, and maybe it wasn't them again, maybe mm -hmm. somebody along the way encouraged them to write this, but they talk about how in the past the faith was conveyed by the family, first of all, mm -hmm. and then by other institutions like, like the local parish, right. and then by the culture more generally. They recognize that there's a crisis in the family, that often the parishes that they're in are not very dynamic, and that the mm -hmm. culture is very much set against the faith. So they see that those things are now missing, the, the, the mm -hmm. transmission belts that we had in the past. They don't have any idea of how to replace them, but they recognize that something is needs miss. to be done. Mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they don't then take the second step, which is maybe we need to find some ways to restore those institutions right. that were the, they're irreplaceable. It's Who really were these else. people? Who were these young people? Who are they? Where did they come from? Well, they I come know they from, came from all over yeah, the they world. they come from all over the world. But they're not all Catholic. No, not all of them are Catholics. Some are, I think, very sincere Catholics and energetic Catholics. Some are more doubtful. There were some non-believers in the mix. There were even some Muslims, according to what, we, mm. what was reported on. So what you get out of this is kind of an echo chamber of what young people are, are talking about. Some of them are closer to the church. Some of them don't even know anything about the church. And in some ways, it may be good to get that on the record, but I have to think that the 
bishops of the Roman Catholic Church pretty much know what young people are thinking and why it is that it's been so difficult to retain them. Yeah, I want to put up another full screen. This also from that pre-synodal document. Look at this. The church can play a vital role in ensuring that these young people are not marginalized but feel accepted. This can happen when we seek to promote the dignity of women both in the church and in wider society. Today there is a genuine problem in society in that women are still not given an equal place. This is also true in the church. Father Gerald Murray, your reaction? Yeah, I read that and I was not happy at all. I do not accept that characterization of the role of women in the church. I think this is a message being given by those who believe in women's ordination, that we won't be happy until women can become priests. Uh, this is not what Jesus Christ established when he founded the church. The apostles were ordained on Holy Thursday by our Lord as the first priests, and the church has always ordained only men. Mm. Now, as regards true equality in the church, uh, that exists because we're all baptized believers. The sons and daughters of God share a radical equality. And I would say, in my experience as a pastor, women do more to promote the mission of the church in the United States than men do. Uh, I wish that weren't the case, but I know when I'm looking for volunteers, I'm looking for catechists, I'm looking mm -hmm. for people to do apostolate, the women are much more willing. There are a variety of reasons for that, but certainly we should never give in to this notion that until women can do everything that a man can do in the church, including being a priest, that somehow the church is being unfair. Jesus Christ was not unfair when he only ordained men. He's divine. He did what he wanted to do, and there's a reason for it. No, you make a good point. I mean, God knows, two of the best-known Catholics, probably the most influential in the 20th century into the 21st, was Mother Teresa and Mother Angelica. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from a pope, that's it. And that is a form of female leadership that I think oftentimes the world ignores and these kids don't know anything about. Yeah. And women have a different you know, way of looking at Perception. things and, and bring different energies into the church. You know, one of the things that happened, I don't know how much it was reported here because I was in Rome last yep. week when, when this was all going on, is that there were some, um, Father calls them uh, uh, women's ordination people. There were actually some women who came along and said, we want female cardinals because right. cardinals don't necessarily have to be priests. It's, mm -hmm. it's in the past, that hasn't been necessarily the case. But it's clear that some, some groups were seeking around the edges, and we've seen this at other synods mm -hmm. and preparations for synods, that in, given what the modern world is, it's easy to get a big megaphone when you're over in Rome and something like this is going on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth saying that Francis himself, however, Pope Francis has said that the question of female ordination is closed. Hmm. Okay, I want to go to this again, another full screen. There is often great disagreement among young people, both within the church and in the wider world, about some of her teachings, which are especially controversial today. Examples of these include contraception, abortion, homosexuality, cohabitation, marriage, and how the priesthood is perceived in different realities in the church. What is important to note is that irrespective of their level of understanding of church teaching, there is still disagreement and ongoing discussion among young people on these polemical issues. As a result, they may want the church to change her teaching or at least to have access to a better explanation and to more formation on these questions. We, the young church, ask that our leaders speak in practical terms about controversial subjects such as homosexuality and gender issues about which young people are already freely discussing without taboo. Father Gerald Murray, I'll give you a first crack at that. What do you think this is about? Right, right. Well, you, this, well, this is about promoting a revolution in the church in which sexual morality and Catholic doctrine uh, will be redefined. And I say that uh, precisely because you do not call Catholic doctrine a polemical issue if you consider it to be true. Polemical, when you call mm -hmm. something polemical, you're basically saying someone's exaggerating to try and control other people by make, you know, enforcing his point of view with fear. Mm -hmm. Catholic teaching about sexual morality is rooted in the way we are, human dignity, the purpose what God created us for. And, you know, I, let me say this, the, 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 we need the teaching to be better explained. The teaching has been explained magnificently by the Catholic magisterium in the last 30 to 40 years. I don't think the problem is the explanation's not there. People either reject it, don't care to read it, or are told it's going to change, so don't bother, 
you know, trying to defend it. Uh, mm -hmm. We do not need a revolutionary movement coming out of a synod on the youth concerning issues that we know are being promoted by secularists and people who think Christian morality is an imposition on man. Mm -hmm. Christian morality is the only way that people can be free and be themselves. That's, that's our message. Mm. Uh, Robert Royal, given this, given what we just read, um, where do you see this shaping that October Synod? Does this become the marching orders for the bishops? We saw this during the Family Synod. It wasn't supposed to be about divorced and remarried Catholics getting communion, but that's what it really became about. And it's a lingering wound and source of confusion throughout the church. Are we looking at Amoris Laetitia part two here? Well, it's very possible because the, the way that the reasoning is going to take place is going to be, again, well, we're not changing doctrine, but we're, you know, we're pastorally reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about the, the, the deep theological issues many times here in, in regard to Amoris Laetitia. I never get tired of saying, look, if young people are going to dispute the first page of, Dennis, of, of Genesis, male and female, he created them, mm. and say that somehow that is not operative any longer. Uh, when our Lord in the New Testament says to the Pharisees, you know, Moses let you divorce because you, you were uh, weak, but I say to you, male and female, he created them. Then he goes on and, and gives that, that tougher right. teaching. If you're going to reject the documents that tell us what Christianity is, where it has begun, if, if Christianity got male and female wrong from the beginning, and Judaism and Christianity got mm -hmm. that wrong, then I don't know what kind of dialogue can go on between people in the contemporary world and the church. Unless the church wants to just join sort of modern culture, in which case it's clear that it will go the way of the, the liberalizing Protestant denominations, which is to say they're all dying. The, one, the ones that survive are the, are the more theologically robust evangelical and, and some of the, the smaller Protestant uh, mm -hmm. faith groups. But otherwise, it's, it's just a concession. And it, we've seen that some elements in and around the Vatican seek to exploit these events precisely for this kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. Father Jerry, last word on this before I get to some other topics. Um, do, do you see this as um, a, a precursor to another Amoris Laetitia, where we have a, a, pra a pastoral consideration that takes on doctrinal implications? I think Bob's point is very uh, prescient here that, indeed, people will take the process and turn it away from really talking about young people need to know. Young people need to know who is Jesus Christ, he is the Son of God, and this is what he taught. Instead, if we have to get into this defensive position which says Catholic teaching on sexual morality is polemical, it's not understood, it's hard to understand, therefore we have to trim it here and there. No, uh, I, I'm worried about what can happen and only because uh, as we said with Amoris Laetitiae, mm -hmm. a synod on the family got turned into a Walter, a Cardinal Walter Casper proposal endorsement that people mm -hmm. who are in adulterous second marriages should freely receive communion in some circumstance. That, that was not what it was supposed to be about. Hmm. I want to move on. Uh, Lettergate exploded since we were last together, uh, Papal Posse. Uh, we saw this uh, doctored photograph of a letter from Pope Benedict that supposedly endorsed, well, I reported it earlier, you know what we're talking about, um, Bishop uh, Vigano, or Monsignor Vigano, uh, resigned, who was head of the communications office. What is the lingering fallout of this? And considering the Pope's condemnation of fake news, has this really wounded the Vatican's communication apparatus? Well, I mean, this is the first of the Pope's close-in collaborators actually to be dismissed. Others, like Cardinal Mueller, who seem to be in some tension with him, mm -hmm. um, have left the scene. Cardinal Burke, of course, uh, most right. notably. The thing I'm most struck about, or the two things I'm most struck about, about this Lettergate controversy, is why do it? Mm -hmm. Monsignor Vigano is not a stupid man, but it was a very foolish thing to take a letter from Pope Emeritus Benedict oh. Uh, setting himself at some distance from these little booklets that came out on theology and then turning it into a kind of endorsement. Well, there are only two reasons why someone would take the great risk of doing this when it's, it's very likely to become known. We've, we've talked about it and lots of others who've commented on the Pope have talked about this. First of all, they're feeling some um, nervousness about the, the critique that he is not in continuity with 
his what went before. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they're worried about his reputation as being a theologian, because he, he's not really ever been seriously involved in theological thought. He's, mm -hmm. he's got his own kind of pastoral approach. But those two things, the lack of continuity and the lack of theological depth, I think somebody somewhere in the Vatican feels nervous about this. And that's why you t take this extreme step of misrepresenting something that was supposed to actually be a private letter to make a defense that turns out to actually create more controversy mm -hmm. than it solved. Uh, Father Jerry, we're seeing another area where there is a tug of war, if you will. Um, again, it's, a, it's an attempt to, it my, to my eyes, spin reality in one way or the other, and you have dueling camps around this Vatican-China deal. There is a camp within the Vatican saying, all is well, China is the great exemplar of Catholic social thought, and uh, this is the only responsible way to go forward. There's Cardinal Zen and others saying, no, 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 this is the end of the underground church. Now, you heard the story I reported earlier on uh, Bishop Guao, who was arrested, held captive, and now released, but he's forbidden to say Mass. What's going on here, and is this another example of um, the, the, the Vatican communications apparatus trying to spin something that is not in continuity with, with, with reality? Well, yes, let's unpack this, Raymond. Uh, as regards to the Chinese issue, I think the communists recognize weakness. They recognize the Vatican wants to deal more than they do. So therefore, they're going to push as much as they can to enforce uh, their control over the Catholic Church by arresting this bishop and then mm. freeing him and forbidding him. Now, as regards to the earlier comment about Monsignor Vigano, it's fascinating. This pope wants to have modern communications. He set up a secretariat for communications. Right. And then what did we have? We had a falsification of a papal communication. They only came clean when uh, secular journalists uh, and some religious journalists pointed out problems. And then they did a drip by drip, uh, limited release, and then finally put out the whole uh, communications out in public. Mm -hmm. The Pope accepted the resignation, but then reappointed this man back to his office mean, in a lesser role, but who knows what mm -hmm. it can exactly mean. And then let's remember this. Vigano, whether he thought about it or not, he very much offended Pope Emeritus Benedict by doing this, mm -hmm. and there's been no public apology to no. Pope Benedict for this. So the impression left here is that this man tried to manipulate it, got caught, but then he's not really being punished in a way that would recognize the gravity of what happened. That is going to hurt the Vatican's credibility uh, with the mm -hmm. secular media, and certainly it doesn't help uh, that this was done in an effort, as we know, to falsify the record about what Benedict thought uh, about one of the authors. Benedict yeah. objected to one of the authors in this series who was in fact a vehement critic of Catholic teaching. And why he was included in this group of writings is his name is Hunterman, a German yeah. theologian. Beyond belief, why would you put a dissident theologian in a, mm. in a series published by the Vatican itself. Very troubling. No, these are two major black eyes, I think, for the Vatican's communication apparatus. Uh, the, both this letter gate as well as this ongoing China story, because the reality on the ground, the reality of a bishop in the underground church being arrested, totally contradicts and undercuts this happy talk that they've been pushing out there. Meanwhile, you've got Zen, who they're attacking as well, publicly. I, I just, I think this does not feel right to a lot of Catholics and to media looking in on this. Well, I mean, we're dealing with a totalitarian regime. Right. You know, a, a, their president, so-called president, just Gee. probably became president for life, mm -hmm. um, which is almost a textbook definition of a di dictatorship totalitarian mm -hmm. regime. You cannot be weak with these people. All the, the, mm. the former Soviet dissidents who stood up to the Soviet Union back during the Cold War say, you cannot gain anything by negotiating in this way mm -hmm. with totalitarian regimes. You can always lose because they can hold out forever. And we, we've seen it's not simply a, a question of, of two opposing views of the world. We've seen the Chinese actually put the screws on the church uh, since February in, right. in increasingly uh, difficult ways. So. I'm very skeptical of wh what's going forward at this point, and the only way to understand this is to look to the people who you trust in the way they judge things, mm -hmm. certainly Cardinal Zen and some others who have yeah. raised the worries, in my mind, are the most credible voices. Yeah, well, that bishop we talked about earlier uh, who was arrested this week, the man has been arrested 20 times sure. just this year. The, the, you know, you, or last year, rather. You can't say that 
This is an anomaly. It happens all over mainland China, and there is a targeting of the underground church. They want to co-opt it into this patriotic association. That's what's happening. And um, I, I, think, I think people undermine their credibility when they try to sure. peddle a false narrative to, to, create, a, uh, to create a pathway uh, for a Vatican uh, China detente. It's not going to work. It won't work. China will win. And if Donald Trump has taught everybody one thing, it is going, playing this game, you will lose. You've got to find another way to disrupt the narrative. Anyway, uh, final comment. I want to share this with you. This is the Pope during Holy Week. He offered this at his Wednesday audience. He told the assembled, and you're seeing the video here, uh, this is a deviation from his prepared remarks. And here I have to say something sad and painful. There are fake Christians, those who say Jesus is risen, I have been justified by Jesus, I have a new life, but I live a corrupt life. These fake Christians will have a terrible end. A Christian, I repeat, is a sinner. We are all sinners. I am one, but we are certain that when we ask forgiveness, the Lord will forgive us. The corrupt person pretends to be an honorable person, but in the end, there is putrefaction in the heart. Father Jerry, your reaction? Well, those are strong words from the Pope, and uh, he certainly is trying to highlight that you should never live uh, a double life, you know, that you mm -hmm. should never be a hypocrite, you know, pretending to be a devout Catholic and then doing horrible things. Mm. Now, the question is, what is, what is his understanding of corruption as an ongoing state in life? Because, you know, the worst sinner can make a confession and then go right to heaven, you know, if he dies in the state of grace and having all of, uh, you know, getting a plenary indulgence. We believe that redemption can happen pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, when the Pope goes off the script, he basically, by saying you're a fake Christian, well, you know, you're, you're a Christian if you're a sinner. You may not be a good Christian, but you're not, you're still a Christian. So mm -hmm. I understand that what he's trying to get at because there are a lot of people who like yeah. to parade around. And by the way, mm -hmm. they're not only those in the mafia, there are other categories who mm -hmm. like to say, listen to me, I know what Catholicism is. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they undermine it by the way they live. Mm. Yeah. Robert Royal, your reaction. And uh, look, in the pontificate of mercy, this is a, this is a kind of discordant note. I don't know. It sounds very much like Jesus to me. <laughs> I'd like to know who he's talking about here, yeah. frankly. I mean, it, it kind of has universal application because obviously everybody is a sinner other right. than the Virgin Mary, right. every human being, right? But the odd thing to, to me about this is that he, he seems to be talking about hypocrites. And so who are these hypocrites? Mm -hmm. They pretend to be honorable and without sin. I don't know too many Christians who will not admit that they're, they're sinners. It's good in a way that he... he addresses this to everybody who is perhaps trying to present themselves one way and privately mm -hmm. living a different mm -hmm. life. But I'm wondering why go off script. I'm getting to be very suspicious in my old age, and I'm wondering why go off script and make a point of saying this. Well, Holy happy Day. Easter to you, and to you. Uh, Robert Royal. Father Jerry Murray, thank you both for being with us. You can follow Robert Royal and Father Jerry's commentary at thecatholicthing.org. As I mentioned earlier, two years ago this week on what was Easter Sunday, we lost our beloved foundress here at EWTN, Mother Mary Angelica. She was the first woman in the history of broadcast to lead a cable network as CEO and host of the flagship show. She inspired millions of viewers all over the world with her folksy wit and wisdom. And for me, she was a mentor and a dear friend. After someone dies, there's an inevitable revision and selective memory that kicks in. As mother's biographer, I've labored to preserve the full mother, Rita Rizzo, unvarnished. That's what she wanted. That's what I did with both biographies. In that spirit, here is our special World Over tribute to the life and legacy of Mother Angelica. Take a look. Mother was born Rita Antoinette Rizzo in Canton, Ohio on April 20th, 1923. She was abandoned by her father at five and left in the care of May Rizzo, her manically depressed mother. Rita and her mother struggled in a ghetto populated by working class Italians and African Americans. She was plagued by disability from the beginning. A stomach ailment proved a turning point. Rita was having difficulty eating and was diagnosed with ptosis of the stomach. The opening of the stomach was constricted she was losing weight and was very ill. Her mother took her to visit a mystic, a woman named Rhoda Wise, 
who claimed to see Jesus and St. Therese. When she met with Rita, Wise merely gave the girl a prayer card, a nine-day novena which Rita and her mother prayed. Nine days later, Rita Rizzo was free of pain and could eat again. She fell madly in love with Jesus and at that point knew for the first time that she had a father in heaven, if not on earth, who cared for her well-being and loved her individually. In 1944, Rita secretly entered a poor Clare convent in Cleveland, imagining she would never see the world again. Then pain intruded. In 1953, Joan Frank was working with Sister Angelica on the second floor of their monastery when this happened. We were scrubbing a hallway in preparation maybe for a feast day or something. And instead of just putting the scrubber, um, she sprinkled the floor with soapy water ahead of it. And when the scrubber came on to the soapy water, it kicked back and hit her and knocked her over, uh, really severely injuring her back. And she was never the same after that. Walking grew more difficult, and Sister Angelica underwent numerous surgeries, including a major one in 1956. The night before the surgery, Dr. Hout came and said, Sister, when you wake up from surgery tomorrow, you might not feel your legs. In fact, you might never walk again. And she says, oh, that shrouded her in darkness, the thought of never walking again. And she said, I promised God that if I was able to walk, I would start a monastery of adoration. That was a promise. That promise contained something I discovered years later. Mother didn't just promise to build a monastery, but a monastery to pray for racial healing. She grew up witnessing the injustice endured by African Americans in her neighborhood and spiritually sought to fight it. She did walk again with the assistance of crutches and a pair of braces, leading her to comment years later, when you make a deal with God, be very specific. She wrote letters to several bishops asking for permission to build a poor Clare monastery in their diocese. Only one bishop responded, the Bishop of Mobile, Birmingham. In 1959, Sister Angelica had been invited to establish a monastery in the Deep South. But how to pay for it? Here we see the first glimmer of Angelica the Entrepreneur. She started a mail order business, a fish lure business to be exact, run by she and a few nuns. That enterprise paid for the construction of the monastery. Once they got to Birmingham, the nuns sustained themselves by roasting peanuts. The little old peanut company distributed their nuts to stores and arenas all over Alabama. At the same time, Mother was offering a Bible study to a group of Episcopalian women that expanded to include many others. This led to an audio tape ministry where her talks were recorded and disseminated, played on the radio, and soon she was invited to speak all over the country. Those talks were electric. I want to take Abraham. Do you have any idea when you read that beautiful scripture, do you ever put guts into it and blood? Or is it just a little story you read? So isn't it wonderful Abraham had faith? Three cheers. Do you really know what he did? Do you know what happened to him? Here's a man, 90 years old. 90. Anybody here 90 years old? See, nobody 90 would even come tonight. <laughs> and here's Abraham sitting near his tent, probably doting. And he hears a voice and it says, Abraham. <laughs> says, huh? <laughs> said, Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham, you shall be the father of a great nation. You 
shall be the father of a great nation. Here's Sarah. <laughs> Listening. She goes, yeah. <laughs> You know what she's thinking? She's thinking whoever that is doesn't know. <laughs> For Abraham believes her, and that's the end of the voice. Nine years later. Nine years. Don't you think Abraham wondered if he ever heard a voice? Don't you think Sarah, oh, Sarah must have been something else. <laughs> Some women are so naggy. I bet she kept saying every three, four months, I, hey, I told you, I told you, I told you. Mother Angelica started to appear on Protestant television programs where she became something of a fixture. Her popularity led her to record a Bible series for the Christian Broadcasting Network, and her friend Jean Morris and Sister Raphael, her vicar, were the crew, marketing team, and primary supporters. By 1978, her television success and the emergence of cable inspired Mother to begin exploring the idea of building her own network, a Catholic cable enterprise. Now, EWTN was founded as a spiritual growth network. That's what Mother said at the time. But the culture at large said, ah, and currents months. in the church would make uh -huh. it into something much more. <laughs> By the early 1980s, the post-Vatican II confusion was at full tilt. Traditions were up for grabs. Devotions were being cast aside. Talk of women's ordination and inclusive language was all the rage. Mother Angelica would have none of it. Despite her unorthodox approach to business, no budgets, no long-term plans, just a radical dependence on divine providence that God would provide, Angelica was quite orthodox when it came to her faith. By the early 1990s, she broadcast many endangered devotions, the rosary, chaplets, and the mass, all performed with an attention to reverence that was not lost on the growing viewership. Mother Angelica was at heart a traditionalist, and factions in the Catholic Church were moving in their own direction, often battling Pope John Paul II and taking issue with his teaching. In 1993, things came to a head for Mother Angelica. She excitedly partnered with the U.S. Bishops' Conference to broadcast World Youth Day from Denver. But when a woman, a mime, assumed the role of Jesus in the Stations of the Cross, Mother had had enough. This moment would change her life and the life of her network forever. It's blasphemous that you dare try to portray Jesus as a woman. You know, as Catholics, we've been terribly quiet all these years. After Vatican Council, those beautiful documents inspired by the Holy Spirit, they're so beautiful when you read those documents, it's like reading scripture. But they were misrepresented and misportrayed and misinterpreted all these years, and every excuse, like this mime, had been blamed on the Vatican documents. I'm tired. I'm tired of being pushed in corners. I'm tired of your inclusive language that refuses to admit the Son of God is a man. I'm tired of your tricks. I'm tired of your deceit. I'm tired of you constantly just making a crack. And then the first thing you know, there's a hole, and all of us fall into it. No. This was deliberate. You made a statement that was not accidental. And this is just as much a lie as the lies we got last night. I am so tired of you liberal church in America. You see this collar? 
we had this little modern collar so that we would really appeal to this modern world, this pagan society. Am I better? No. But I'm being realistic. We're going to change it. We're going to look very Roman. Because I'm making a statement. You've hidden your agenda with a mime. My agenda is not hidden, but I have yet to hear anyone contradict you or cross you or say anything to distress you. Well, I'm saying it. I'm saying it. I say it as an individual who has a right before God to be Catholic, and I resent. I resent your pushing your ways and your anti-Catholic, ungodly ways upon the masses of this country. Live your life. Live your falsehood. Live your lies. Leave us alone. Do what you want to do. You have that privilege from God himself. But don't pour your poison, your venom, on all the church. Coming out of World Youth Day, Mother Angelica would revert to the traditional habit of her youth and double down on her brand of vibrant orthodoxy. The activist spirit reemerged in Angelica. She would lobby against the film The Last Temptation of Christ, seeing it as blasphemous. She fought against inclusive language in the liturgy and agitated on behalf of the unborn. Despite Thank Mother's you. activism, throughout the 1990s, she still knew how to have a good time. Watch this. What do you think, God's a yo-yo? <laughs> you know, he's got a, this century we do this, that century we don't. Hey, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Raymond's with me, and it's his birthday. Really? You know what? How old are you? I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> well, do you want me to tell you how old you look? Oh, oh. <laughs> you really want to know? Well, guess. Uh, if it's honest. Well, I'll tell you the truth if you can guess it. But cool could you be? Is it that I difficult? I could say you're 30, but no, you can't be 30. Why 40? Not? 40? <laughs> 40? What's wrong with 40? I was bit older than me. I what was, do you mean? <laughs> 40? Yeah. It was 40 once. Yeah, but I'm not even close to 40, though. Well, how would I know? You don't tell me, so I'm guessing. My goodness. All right, if you're not 40 okay. and you're not 30, you got to be between. 31. Oh, really? 31. That's all you are. Yeah. And I'm aging by the minute. <laughs> I'll never forget. I've said it so most of you haven't heard it. This woman calls me up and she says, oh, my husband's living with another woman. I said, in my house. What? <laughs> well, kick him out. <laughs> How are you going to say that nice? <laughs> you could say, well, how unfortunate. You know? <laughs> Why don't you just open the door and <laughs> tell him to leave? You can't say it nice. It's not a nice thing. So after I said that little gave her that little advice. She said, oh, I can't. What do you mean you can't? They have no place to go. <laughs> well, hell is where they're aiming for. <laughs> Tell them to go there. <laughs>
don't you air these people? And I said, no, I won't, because I don't think they're Catholic. He says, by what right do you have to say that? I said, I own the network. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you won't always be there. And I said, I'll blow the damn thing up before you get your hands on it. <laughs> So they caught you on a good day. <laughs> yeah, on a good day. I could watch those all night. A 1996 trip to Bogota, Colombia, proved decisive for Mother. There she encountered a statue of the divine child Jesus, the Divino Nino. She believed the child Jesus called her to build a temple in his honor, and he would, quote, help those who help you. Mother the Builder had a new project. In the mid-1990s, Mother Angelica single-handedly created Catholic radio in the United States. She made her shortwave radio programming available for free to anyone who would buy a station in the U.S. Many responded, and EWTN expanded to reach those in cars and homes and workplaces inaccessible via television. Today, there are more than 300 EWTN radio affiliates nationwide. In November of 1997, Mother continued to advocate for orthodoxy. For Angelica, the spouse she lived for and loved, Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, was not a concept or a theological idea to be considered, but a person to be adored and defended. This helps to explain her indignation when she read a pastoral letter on the Eucharist by Cardinal Roger Mahoney of Los Angeles. She found the content of the letter to be confusing and vexing. She casually referenced this letter at the end of her live show, sitting right here one night, I'll and accidentally it. crossed a canonical one. line. When the average layperson, long forgotten whatever catechism they learn, are told that there's no need for confession, there's no need for baptism, there there's not really a body and blood, soul, and divinity. In fact, the Cardinal of California is teaching that it's bread and wine before the Eucharist and after the Eucharist. Uh, I'm afraid my obedience in that diocese would be absolutely mm. zero. <laughs> and I hope everybody else is in that diocese is zero. Cardinal Mahoney took offense at those comments and demanded that Mother apologize and clarify her statement. Mother gave it to him. So I do want to apologize to the Cardinal for my remark, which I'm sure seems excessive. But he has asked me for clarification. And this is what I would like to do this evening. This is my opinion, and this is how I saw it when I read it. What came through to me was the principal focus in this letter of assembly, the concentration on the assembly, all the people in the church, rather than the Eucharist. So I felt the letter was unclear to what the church teaches about the real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. At one point, she raised questions about Cardinal Mahoney's assertion that Jesus' presence was in the simple gifts of bread and wine. Watch this. I'm a simple woman. And I don't understand this, you see. So does that mean Christ is present before the consecration in the bread and wine? Is that what it means? Or does it mean that he is present after the consecration? Well, if he's present after the consecration, in what way? Did he just kind of hop into the bread and wine, but it's still bread and wine? Or has it become his body and blood? Well, if it's still bread and wine, why would I adore him? Why would I kneel and prostrate myself 
between what to, to red and white. Cardinal Mahoney pursued Mother and meant to have her pay a price for her continued critique of his pastoral letter. He demanded a Vatican investigation of her community, urged other clergymen to encourage Mother Angelica to publicly apologize to him. Throughout, she refused, standing on principle. During that very tense time, a woman came to pray for Mother Angelica at the monastery here, following her live show one evening. And following that prayer session, Mother's legs were healed. For the first time in decades, Angelica could walk and even dance without crutches or braces. You want to dance? Like well, let's, let's dance. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> She always thought that healing was for the people, she would say. It was a way to build up their faith, Mother believed. It was also a needed shot in the arm during a very dark and trying period in Mother's life. In the year 2000, to protect her network and at the urging of her closest advisors, she resigned from the leadership of EWTN. The fear was that her enemies would use her status as a religious to exert control over the network or damage her community. Though Mother Angelica Live continued, Mother Angelica CEO came to an end. Still, the stress of church politics, the public spat with Mahoney, a Vatican investigation, and age brought on a mini-stroke that caused Mother's face to sag and necessitated the wearing of a patch. At 78, Mother Angelica wasn't going to let a patch slow her down. Not when there were people in need of her homespun, street-smart brand of hope. This is I'm your... surprised. We were together for an hour or so today. We made your Christmas show, right? Right. I right. thought it was great. Oh, it was great. We had a good time. Oh, we had a great time. All kind of treats. Oh, yeah. Yes. I was uh, absolutely floored with your amount of knowledge. <laughs> wait, wait. Well, what's this little... What's that? Oh, I want something in a little while, and I thought I would bump it up a little bit. See what I have to deal with? <laughs> <laughs> you never had it so good. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> then on Christmas Eve 2001, in her chapel, where she had gone to welcome her beloved, Mother Angelica was felled by a debilitating stroke. It stole her speech and nearly killed her. Over the next 15 years, she would live out her mission and continue it in unexpected ways, largely in silence. Mother was once again the silent contemplative she had vowed to be back in 1947. Aside from a very few public appearances, including the release of her biography, Mother was largely confined to her cell, bedridden. On Easter Sunday, March 27th, Mother Angelica escaped to her reward, and she left an incredible and rich legacy. Her nuns, her brothers, her shrine, and the countless souls she touched and continues to touch today. There's much more to say about Mother Angelica's hidden years, those 15 long years of silence. I called it her grand silence, and it was. She struggled to create new monasteries and strengthen her order. It is a tale of heroic acceptance of hardship and suffering for the good of others. What a gift it's been for me to not only know her, but to fulfill my promise to tell her full story and now it's all out there. Her whole life was truly a testament to divine providence. Dear Reverend Mother, we miss you. May your soul rest in peace. But your spirit, I'll bet, is keeping everyone up there hopping. She once said, eternity is an extension of what we do here. So I know there's a lot of activity and laughter where she is. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. New York Times columnist and author Ross Douthat is here to talk about his new book, To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. Set your DVRs. Don't miss a moment. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, Thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.